the theme of Israel and this wake-up call that has gone to Israel. And we'll see how remarkable that has made a change to Israel's outlook. It's bringing them closer to God. And at the same time, we shall see that this is a wake-up call for ourselves. Because as our other two speakers have said, we're that much closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so the first two talks have set the scene for the build-up to the coming of Go to come against Israel, to decimate Israel, two-thirds killed, uh, and the whole uh, structure of Israel is going to be destroyed because the Lord Jesus doesn't need the government and the way of thinking of the Jewish people at the moment. It's going to be a fresh start. And so what is there has got to be swept away, and the great earthquake will help in that. But what we have to remember is that uh, although Gog is going to invade and destroy Israel as a nation, God is already several steps ahead. And as we have been told in previous talks, before Gog's invasion, the Lord Jesus will be back on the earth. He will have gathered his saints together, raised the dead, taking them to Sinai for judgment. And there his army will be prepared. Uh, and in a twinkling of an eye, those who are approved at the judgment seat will become immortal to have the power that the Lord Jesus has, that the angels have, that they can do wonderful miracles. And this army is prepared. Uh, and in its time of preparation, that's when Elijah goes forth to bring about this reformation in Israel, to begin to turn their hearts back to the father Abraham, to respect the promises and the things that are uh, given there, and wipe away all these extra things that the Jews have added which have nullified the law of Moses. So Elijah's work is to take them back to the real teaching of the law of Moses. Uh, and then from there, they can be converted to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So October the 7th was a brutal wake-up call for the nation of Israel because their leaders were taking them further and further away from God, as we shall see. But now they're being pushed back on the right path in preparation for what is going to happen. And we have been talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ for 175 years in our community. Uh, and people are saying, well, you know, you keep on every prophecy day, you talk about the return of the Lord Jesus is close, but, but it's not come, and we've had so many prophecy days. And so people are beginning to question, well, has God a timetable? Is there a day when the Lord will come? Well, we know what Paul said on Mars Hill when he was talking to the Athenians, that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And so we know God has an appointed day, and it all revolves around the Lord Jesus Christ as the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And so we say, well, has God revealed that timetable to us? And assuredly he has. Uh, and where do we find that timetable? Well, we find it right at the beginning of the Bible. In the six days of creation and God resting on the Sabbath day, a thousand years with the Lord is at one day. Because God has this 7,000 year plan for the earth and there's coming the Sabbath of rest, the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ. And so when we look at the timetable, we can see we're very close. Now, traditionally, when we've looked at this, we, we've started it at creation itself. But that doesn't seem right, because... Everything was very good. Sin it hadn't entered into the world. There was no need for a redeemer at that stage. It's only when the fall came that there was a need for a redeemer. And the problem is we aren't told just how far in, 
how old Adam and Eve were when the fall took place. So we have an unknown starting point because God doesn't want us to know the exact day and the year. But we have to be confident that in God's plan and purpose and remember that chronology is not an exact science, that 4,000 years after the fall came the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when was Jesus born? BC 4, BC 6. So it was BC 4 and died at the age of 33, that would be AD 27, 29. Um, that period there. As I say, chronology is not exact. But from there, if we go 2,000 years, then we come to 20, 27, 29. And it shows us how close we are, brothers and sisters. The coming of the Lord Jesus is very close. And we have to accept that we have to be watching and waiting for him, as we read in that Revelation reading. So there does remain a rest, a Sabbath rest, uh, for the people of God during the millennial age. And then there will be the rest of the ages beyond the millennium, that, that period, the aeon uh, and ad, that period beyond, when all mankind will be immortal and God can dwell with man upon the earth. And what a wonderful period that will be. So angelic hands have been working and God has revealed through his prophets and I just want us um, very quickly just to look at Daniel chapter 2. Uh, no need to turn to it because it's one that we know. I just want to pick out a few key features. Uh, we know it had a head of gold which represented Babylon and then the silver and the brass and the iron, Rome. Uh, and the Roman Empire uh, in its final manifestation came to the end in World War I. And we're in the stage of the forming of the feet. So we're in these latter days. And this iron clay feet represents a very unstable foundation for this huge image and they're only being formed for one purpose to bring this confederation of nations against the land of Israel because the thing about all these empires was that they controlled Israel and Daniel's image we're told is what will happen in the latter day so these feet will bring this image against God's people, against Israel, only to be destroyed on the mountains of Israel. So I just want to ask one question. Who is the latter-day head of gold? Because that is so important to us as we look out on a world that is so anti-God. And the chapter beyond what we read in Revelation, Revelation chapter 17 and uh, it's already been uh, taken to us there, but the description there is of a religious power. It has a golden cup full of abominations and written on the forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, uh, and mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And she's a power that has persecuted believers down through the ages, both saints and Jews drunken with the saints' blood. And it's associated, the seven heads are associated with a seven-hilled city, uh, and the ten horns represent ten kings that shall be in the very final days um, opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ, because they make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb overcomes them. And there's only one place, brothers and sisters and young people, that fits that bill, uh, and that's the Vatican. This is the latter day uh, representative of this head of gold which is directing Daniel's image to come against the nation of Israel. And if one goes to the Vatican, you'll see on a corner just by St. Peter's this plaque, a, a picture, a kind of shrine. And it says at the bottom, Mother Ecclesia. And it's interesting, isn't it, how many of the daughters 
the Protestant daughters are now coming back to Rome and acknowledging the Pope as their head. And there's a little emblem there which says, totally yours. And there's a little M in the corner there, and that M stands for Mary. What this church is, is a false church. It's worshipping the mother rather than the son. It turns everything upside down. And it is based on the seven hills, uh, seven hills of Rome and has persecuted Bible believers. Uh, and what's so interesting, remembering that Daniel's image uh, is what happens in the latter days, that the European Union, as it is today, was founded by devout Catholics who based it upon Charlemagne's empire, the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire. And so we can see that everything fits. So we read together, just turn to Revelation chapter 16, that introduction which we read. The sixth angel pours out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The Turkish Empire was dried up in World War I when the legs came to an end. And because of that, it enabled all the countries, and Israel included, to eventually be set up. Because this image is going to come against an Israel which possesses Jerusalem, as we've been told, and is rich and prosperous as in the land. So this was a very important step that brought the end of the legs uh, um, but brought about the forming of Israel and the forming of the feet. Uh, and then he sees, and this is what we want to just hone in on, are these three unclean spirits like frogs which come out of these three powers that uh, represent the Europe and Russia of today, the dragon, Russia, the beast, uh, Europe, uh, and the false prophet, the Vatican, uh, and they're speaking the same language, uh, and it's associated with unclean spirits like frogs. Now, frogs were the symbol when France was a republic, AD 4th and 5th centuries, um, when they elected their leader by popular acclaim which is the very same kind of thing that happened when many centuries later the people of France rose up against the church and against the aristocracy and overthrew them and established their own republic. And what the slogan was, which is so important, was liberty. I mean, to them, liberty from the church rule and the Bible. We can believe whatever we want. We can decide what is right. And equality. There's no having to respect the clergy and the aristocracy. We're all equal. Uh, as long as you accept that I'm right, then we're all equal. And fraternity, the brotherhood of man, sorry, um, we can all live in peace. Now, that was their ideal, but we've seen war after war after war as a result of this spirit which pervades the whole of the world. It's gone out to all the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So there is a spirit that is going out into the world which is summarized by this liberty, equality, fraternity, which turns nations against Israel. Oh, and we'll look at this in a moment. The next two verses show where we are in the scheme of things. Behold, I come as a thief. This is the Lord Jesus to his household. He's saying that to us now. I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Uh, and then it says, he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So who is the he? It's the I come as a thief. It's the work of the Lord Jesus now 
when he comes back to increase this anti-Israel feeling so that the nations come down. Remember in Deuteronomy 28, God says, I will bring a nation against you, Rome, in the AD 70. God does this. He wants to redeem his people. He knows the only way to redeem his people is to humble them from the pride that they have at the moment. So that's the picture in Revelation uh, chapter 16. And if we just drop Daniel's image in there, we can see the links between them. Uh, um, what we know is going to happen is that uh, Europe is going to become a strong power, and we see that happening because of America saying, you know, if you're not going to contribute to a NATO, well, you're on your, if you get invaded, well, that's your own fault. And this pressure is now on Europe to rearm, uh, and Germany is leading that movement. A very interesting article yesterday. So Europe has got to be a strong power. Uh, and represented by the western foot. The eastern foot is Russia of today and with the Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church. But what we know is that that image is going to come down, first of all, to Constantinople, to take Constantinople, and then from there to come down into Egypt and to come down into Israel to take Jerusalem. And we know the Vatican has always wanted to have control of Jerusalem, and she will get her way, as we shall see. So October the 7th, as I say, was Israel's wake-up call and was ours. So how was it Israel's wake-up call? Well, the Netanyahu government was very right-wing. This was the first time that Israel has had such a right-wing um, government. Um, when we're talking in Israel, right wing, we're talking about the religious parties. People who say Israel are God's people. This is God's land. We run Israel to suit the laws that God has given us. So on the Sabbath, no trains don't run. Whereas the previous government had been extremely left wing. Now, the left wing is, has the idea that Israel is no different from any other nation. It's just a secular nation. When we say secular, we mean no associations with, with the religion. In fact, the left hate religious demonstrations. They believe that that's all wrong. That's why they got all the trouble in Israel. If only Israel gave up this religious, being different spirit, then we would live at peace. And that's what the left were pushing. Uh, and interestingly, when Israel was set up in 1948, Ben Gurion was very much uh, uh, setting up a secular state. Oh, he did embrace, you know, religious Jews are welcome too. But basically, it was uh, a very uh, left wing. Uh, and in the 75 years, step by step, Israel is being moved. And when Netanyahu came with this last election, that was a huge jump to move Israel to being a religious nation, the people of God. And prior to October the 7th, 65% of the Israelis supported this religious matter. Only 35 were secular. So you can see how things have swung. And since October the 7th, there has been a huge change in the attitude of the ordinary Israeli people. They recognize that they are special people. They're beginning to wear, they're merely symbols, but uh, you know the kippur and the prayer shawl uh, and attending synagogues. There has been a huge sea change for the ordinary people in Israel. They have responded to this wake up call. Uh, and one of the kibbutzim that was the center of the attack was a very left-wing uh, kibbutz at uh, Um where there was a huge massacre on October the 7th. And this is a picture taken 
in uh, December time, there's a big banner on the outside which says, remember what Amalek did to you. Now, the very thought of an extreme left-wing kibbutz quoting scripture would have seemed impossible before October the 7th. Now, they're looking to God and quoting scripture. Just, just a tiny little glimpse of the, the change that is taking place. So, why is Israel so hated? Well, because Israel is a country run for the benefit of the Jews, uh, and their laws are built around that, um, uh, although it is still open to non-religious Jews, but this is what sticks in the guts of the left wing. Here is a country where liberty, equality, fraternity, the spirit of humanism which we see sweeping the world, affecting this country with its mad ideas about gender and all these things. It's all part of this uh, spirit of liberty, equality. We can do what we like and we make our own laws. But as far as Israel is concerned, liberty, no. They're not free to do what they want. They're God's people. They have to do what God wants. Equality, no, we're not equal to the other nations. We're God's people. Fraternity, what between extremist Muslims like Hamas and us? No, exterminate Hamas. And this is why the world has suddenly burst in its anti-Semitism. Because Israel doesn't conform to the spirit of the age. It is a different nation. And God is pushing it more and more that way. To show that people, that this is God's own people. The left wing in Israel, unfortunately, are the people with power. They have money because they're backed by American Jews who are very left wing. Uh, most of the Israeli press um, are very biased against Netanyahu and what is happening. They are left wing. Very few right wing um, press and TV. The judiciary system is completely left wing. The military are completely left wing, uh, and many of the politicians. And so there's a fundamental battle going on in Israel between the leaders who are left wing uh, and trying to say, oh, we've got to make peace, so, uh, stop fighting in Gaza and make peace, and well, let, let Hamas carry on. Uh, uh, there's a big battle between the left wing and the ordinary people who are saying, no, uh, that's not the right way. We are a special people. We are religious people. We are God's people. Because the left wing, their whole policy was that uh, Hamas has changed. That's why at 4.30 on October the 7th, uh, the Israeli observers reported to their leaders that there was big activity taking place, something really massive was going, looked as if it was going to take place. And so they had a little meeting. I said, well, it's 4.30. Hamas is changed. It's not going to attack. Go to sleep. We'll have a meeting at 8 o'clock. We know at 6.30 they came in and did their destruction. And when they met at uh, 8 o'clock, they found that a lot of the pilots hadn't kept up their training because of their left-wing protests against Netanyahu. Uh, and so there were very few. It took a long time before the army came. And in fact, it was the ordinary people on the ground, the reservists, the ordinary Jews, who jumped into their cars with their weaponry and, and drove down to Gaza and prevented a much bigger massacre if they hadn't come. It wasn't the army. They were asleep. They were left-wing. And in fact, we know that when, on October the 7th, the Hamas had plans, detailed plans, of each kibbutz where they were going to be sent. And that was because Israel government had allowed many more Palestinians 
from Gaza to work in these left-wing uh, settlements, and the left-wing settlements were very happy because they wanted to make friends with the Hamas, and that they didn't see anything wrong. But what they were doing, they were going back and reporting just where the safe rooms were in each house, and where the weapons were stored, and where the entrances were, and where the schools were, and all this detail. So, we know, we're not going to look at it, but we know what a brutal massacre took place. And it showed the total folly of these left-wing ideas. Many were killed, tortured, others dragged as captives into Gaza. Now, this problem with the army being left-wing was very well illustrated by this Spanish gentleman who's in the high-level military group, who every time there was a war between Israel and Hamas, the high military group, people from Europe, uh, military people, would go to Israel and deconstruct what had happened, learn the lessons. Uh, and the Spanish gentleman uh, he said, you know, on my last visit uh, at the end of 2021, which was when the left-wing government was in place, he, he said, we're appalled that when the military gave us their presentations about the threats that they were facing, the first thing they talked about was climate change. He said, how mad is that? Uh, and they're sending a message back to Hamas that... Israel is weak. Their leaders are, are, are just going off the radar, as it were. Uh, and it gave Hamas the encouragement to proceed with their plans. And as I say, the military and political leaders are still uh, very left-wing. And at the moment, you know, there's a big battle in Israel. Netanyahu says we've got to finish. Uh, we've got to get rid of Hamas. But many of the military leaders say, no, we've got to stop the fighting uh, and hope that we can get the hostages. And uh, we, we can't finish off Hamas. We've got to let them survive. But the people on the ground, the ordinary soldiers, they know that that's the only thing. If they're going to have peace, and remember, a, a, a lot of Israelis who live near the Gaza settlements and a lot of Israelis in the north of Israel have been out of their houses for four or five months, uh, accommodated in um, hotels. And the only way to bring peace is to get rid of Hamas, to get rid of Hezbollah. <laughs> And I listened to Avi Abelo, who is, uh, he is a reservist. He needn't be, he's 50, so he's above the age that they need to serve, but he is serving. He's got two t sons in the army, so he's very close to the ground. He is a man that lives on the so-called West Bank, what we call Judea and Samaria, uh, a settler, hated by the left wing because the left wing say, if there were no Israelis on the West Bank, then we would be at peace. It's only because of the presence of Israel on the West Bank that all this trouble is there. Well, October the 7th has shown that that isn't the case. But he always emphasizes that, yeah, we don't agree with our leaders, but we, the people of Israel, with our feet on the ground, we are going to win. We're going to get rid of Hamas. And he always ends his broadcast. You know, we trust in Hashem. And he points upwards. And he's got his weapon strapped to him. And he taps his weapon and in our weaponry. Uh, as we have seen, Israel has a great pride in her weaponry. But we know the outcome, and we're going to see how that can work out. But Israel doesn't just have a problem with Hamas in Gaza. It has a great problem with the United Nations 
who organizes what goes on in Gaza. The United Nations uh, works hand in glove with Hamas, it has now been revealed. And what is so interesting that just very recently, last fortnight, three weeks, the headquarters of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency is in southern uh, Gaza. And underneath the United Nations headquarters was the Hamas headquarters. And it was in an underground tunnel 20 meters below, and Hamas didn't think that Israel would ever discover it. But as she's been taking various uh, places, she's been accumulating maps and documents and interrogating Hamas terrorists who have uh, surrendered. And they learned that underneath the headquarters of UNRWA is the Hamas headquarters. And they couldn't find the entrances, so they had to dig down. And when they got 20 meters down, they found a broke into the tunnel uh, and then went in. And they found this huge data center left intact, full of incriminating evidence of how Hamas has been operating. So a real treasure trove which is being analyzed at the moment. But 20 meters above, was the uh, UNRWA's own data center. Now, they abandoned their center. Why? I don't know, but uh, about October the 12th, they abandoned it. And you can see from all the cut wires, they made sure that all their incriminating evidence was smuggled out, so all their computers and the evidence from the um, cameras was smuggled out. But you can see the cables which supply the electricity to Hamas down below, 20 meters down below, uh, they left those cables there. So Israel now has moved its way. You can see from the colored area how she started in the north and has now come to the bottom. And now the last uh, place to be taken is Rafa. Uh, and we see now the great conflict between Israel and the nations. Israel says we've got to go in, we've got to remove every last Hamas. Britain, United States, Europe say, no, you can't do that, there'll be a terrible massacre, been enough people killed, you can't do it. Uh, and Netanyahu is having to devise schemes and if Israel could take Rafa without huge civilian um, casualties, then that would silence her enemies. And that's what Netanyahu is planning, how they can move people out. And they're planning, um, and this is only in planning stage, but the idea is to build tent cities um, so that people can be moved out uh, have them by the Mediterranean, have a floating port so that aid can come and go direct to the Palestinians rather than being diverted into Hamas, who takes most of it. And what it doesn't use, it sells at high prices back to the Gazans, whom it was supposed to go for free. I can't tell you exactly how it's going to work out, but I do believe that they will destroy Hamas. It has to be for there to be a time of peace. And they also have to deal with Hezbollah in the north because Hezbollah is the most armed state as far as I know. 150,000 rockets and these are not the crude rockets of Hamas but sophisticated rockets which are all pointed at Israel. And Every day they have been firing rockets, not in huge quantities because they don't want to stir up the hornet's nest, as it were, but just enough to antagonize Israel. And every day Israel has been going in and destroying pinpoint uh, bombings of uh, the launching sites and where Hamas and Hezbollah officials are. 
but the time will come when they have to deal with that. So clearly there's uh, a lot of work to be done and as Brother uh, Jenner made, uh, prophecy is about the unexpected, the miracle. I thought that was a very telling phrase because it, it seems impossible. How can Israel alone deal with all these threats? The Houthis as well have got to be dealt with. But God works miracles. If the God of Israel is behind Israel because he needs Israel to be at peace but trusting in their own strength and their weaponry in order that when that is broken then their pride is taken away. And there's only one person I can trust in and that is the Lord God. So these threats have to be dealt with. So what steps would lead to peace and safety, which we know from Ezekiel 38, verse 8 and verse 11, makes it very clear this has got to be. And we've puzzled for a long time. How can it be? But the closer we get there, then the more we can see, yes, it would be possible if uh, the threats were dealt with, that yes, you could get a time of peace and safety. October the 7th was the wake-up call that God has given to his people. So that's taken place. They've been alerted. That you can't trust Hamas. These left-wing ideas are ridiculous. We are having to trust in the most high, but in our weapons. So step two will be to eliminate Hamas, to eliminate Umrah, uh, and to get the Arab nations to help in re-educating uh, the Palestinians because UNRWA run the schools and the EU for years have been complaining about the textbooks which are used, which glorifies to young children the, that they have to destroy Israel. Israel is the enemy uh, and we've got to get rid of them um, because this is their whole ethos. This land belongs to the Muslims. No Jews here. They want it Jew free. So those, that organisation has to disappear and be replaced by people who are prepared to educate the children in better ways. And then the third step would be that any Arabs living in um, Judea, Samaria and in Gaza would have to agree that Israel has a right to this land and you know, agree to them, as many Arabs have. They live in peace in Israel, support Israel, and have prospered. They live in prosperity. All those uh, who are in Gaza and the so-called West Bank live in hovels in comparison because all their money is spent on trying to get rid of Israel instead of working with Israel. So that's the next step, that anybody living there, in other words, we've been told that there will be Palestinians in Gaza, but they'll have to accept that Israel has a right to the land. And it's only on that condition can they remain. And then from that position of strength, then Israel can work with the Arab nations. Arab people respect strength. That's why they're so disappointed with Biden, who all the time is showing weakness. Instead of retaliating against Iran when she sends uh, rockets and that into her bases, uh, she works around the periphery and isn't prepared to stand up, whereas Israel is prepared to stand up. And so we can see a possible way forward. Uh, step one is to ensure that Israel is military strong uh, and trusting in her own skills. That's important. It's wrong. It's time of trespass, as uh, Brother Mike took us to in Ezekiel 38, that uh, 
Israel are, it is a time of trespass, this time of peace which is to come, because they're not trusting in God. They're trusting in their own military strength. And at the same time, they then got to prepare to work with the moderate Arab nations. These are God's children. They're going to be blessed in the kingdom, as we have seen. Uh, and at the same time, there will be increasing Christian opposition. Because this image that's going to come to destroy Israel, uh, Ezekiel 38, Daniel chapter 2, are of Christian nations. Step three is God's going to allow that to happen. Israel to be defeated, absolutely decimated, and her pride broken. And then from that, from their position of deep humility, they will then be prepared through the work that Elijah has been doing in the meantime before this invasion to embrace their saviour. They've been educated in the law of Moses, taking away all the clutter that modern Israel adds to it. They'll see it in its clarity that this is pointing forward to a Messiah who is going to be put to death, going to be crucified. And now, I don't think at that stage they will be told by Elijah that it actually is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's got to come from them. But in the day when they do, as Zechariah uh, chapter 12 and verse 10, which Stephen took us to, it, we can see the parable, parallel with the day of Pentecost. When Peter and the other apostles said to the Jews of their day, you know, God sent you his son, his Messiah, and you put him to death. Uh, uh, and when that reality dawned on them, they cried out from the heart, men and brethren, what should we do to be saved? We, we killed our Messiah. Uh, and what did Peter and the others say? Repent and be baptised. And in the many pools in Jerusalem, thousands were baptised, immersed into the water, uh, and walked in the hope of a resurrection and a return of the Lord Jesus. And so it will be at the end time when they see the marks of crucifixion in the hands and the feet of this saviour who's come miraculously and split them out of olives and with mighty power has zapped those that enemies that are still alive just sat them to death. They will recognise. They will know. There's only one person who's been crucified who claims to be alive. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And chapter 13 and verse 1 says, this river which is now formed with the splitting of the mount will be the place where their sins will be washed away. And they will enter into the new covenant, be in the same position as we are now, as brothers and sisters of Christ. So, we see that there have to be great changes and yes, the steps, each one seems miraculous, but that's what prophecy is about. God has told us it will happen. And we have to have that faith that it will happen. God will bring it about. It has brought about the return of the Jews having been scattered for 2,000 years, come back to their land and now possess Jerusalem. We can trust the word of God. So I now want to just look at the Vatican and the role of the Vatican. Because uh, Rome has always wanted control of Jerusalem. And in fact, during the Crusades, they did succeed. And then came Mohammed and his hordes and drove them out and they lost control of Jerusalem. Now Israel is a nation then the opportunity now comes to be the possessor of Jerusalem. And I'll just go back to 1904 when Herzl went to see Pius X, the current Pope, and said, I want your help. We're going to set up a homeland in Palestine. Will you help us? 
And he was bluntly told, no, we don't want you there. And if you go back, well, then we'll convert you and make you Christians. And his final straw was, Jerusalem must not get into the hands of the Jews. This is what Herzl recorded in his diary. <laughs> there was a fascinating article just this week in The Independent. The person that's in control of the Vatican's secret archives is retiring and is writing a book about many of the things that are hidden in these archives. And he was being interviewed uh, and asked why didn't the Pope do anything World War I? Well, he was afraid that if he did something then it would make the matter worse. And then he was asked, well, you know, he didn't say anything after World War I said World War I and World War II. Uh, he didn't do anything after that to speak out about the terrible things that happened to the Jews. Uh, and see what this retiring chap said. Pagano attributes Pius's post-war silence to his concerns about the creation of a Jewish state. The Vatican had a long tradition of supporting the Palestinian people and was anxious about the fate of Christian religious sites in the Holy Land if the territories were turned over to the newly created state of Israel. Any word from Pius about the Holocaust, even after the war, could have been read in political terms as a support for the foundation of a new state. So I thought that was lovely because it shows they're not interested in Jews, they're interested in supporting the Palestinians. And that reached a climax um, in 2015. But I just put a little bit in there because in the United Nations, uh, the Palestinian Authority and the Vatican um, don't have any official standing but our observers. And for years and years, they sat side by side. Just recently, there have been more members, and so they've now separated. But I can't imagine the Vatican didn't give lots of advice to the Palestinians as to how to handle the Israeli situation to uh, push the Palestinian agenda. It, we know that they must have had many interesting things, but. Uh, and June the 26th, 2015, uh, the uh, Vatican made this uh, treaty with the Palestinians. Pope Francis has decided to make the Catholic Church's feeling about the Palestine, Palestine official. And so uh, they recognise the state of Israel uh, as official. We know there never was a state of Israel, a state of Palestine, uh, and really this isn't a state of Palestine. It, it isn't run like a normal country at all. But the Vatican wanted to push the Palestinian agenda. Now, the year before, the Pope had been to Israel um, and gone to uh, Israel and gone to uh, the Palestinian areas, Ramah. But the Pope had a mass in Bethlehem. Now this is, Bethlehem is uh, on the West Bank, as it were, uh, and controlled by the Palestinians. And there he is behind this huge mural of the birth of the Lord Jesus. The three former Popes, Benedict, John Paul II, John Paul I, were depicted as the three wise men. Over on the other side here, you have a nun, and you have a monk with his cross uh, hanging down there. And Joseph is depicted with the kaffir, uh, the uh, clothing, the head covering, beloved of Yasser Arafat, to denote Palestine, Palestinian state. You'll notice even Jesus himself is covered with the same thing. Uh, and note too that Mary and Joseph are in the colours so beloved of the Catholic Church. And so Pope Francis is a Jesuit, so that should alert us, has 
very effectively eliminated any Jewish connection with the birth of the Lord Jesus. Jesus was a Palestinian. That's the message that comes out from Bethlehem. And that's what the Pope supports. And it is through his counselling that's the way the Palestinians have worked to eliminate any connection between Israel and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. No role for the Jews. And just last year, he exalted the uh, Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, made him a cardinal, so that now the Pope has a direct line from this cardinal uh, in dealing with uh, these matters. But this just says at the bottom that there was this uh, celebration in the Vatican City and in the presence of official Palestinian delegation along with official ecclesiastical and popular delegation, delegations from Palestine, Jordan, all parts of the world, including member of the executive committee of the Palestine Liberation Organization. That's what uh, Arafat was so pushing. And interestingly, the Palestinian flag was shown because they wanted to show the world that this state has got nothing to do with Israel. Israel doesn't belong to this land. This is our land. This is Muslim territory. We've got to get rid of the Jews. And we know how the Vatican works hard behind the scenes to try and bring peace. And she's working with Russia. How significant to try and bring peace to the current situation. Just this week, there was uh, an optic in the uh, rhetoric from the Vatican about uh, Israel, uh, the criticism that too many lives have been shed, you know, 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, and these are all Hamas figures, no confirmation at all. We know most of them are uh, the terrorists themselves, but yes, there have been uh, a lot of civilian deaths, but the ratio is far smaller than any other nation has achieved because Israel takes great care of warning people, dropping leaflets, sending text messages, even phoning Palestinians say, we're going to be attacking this town, get out. And often it's Hamas that shoots them as they try to flee. But uh, the tension has been ratcheted because of this carnage of 30,000 deaths. And so Israel has protested. For Israel, there's lots of work to be done, but its situation is more tense. The Pope insists that the Oslo Accords be honoured and that a two-state solution be pursued. Francis has full confidence in this uh, Latin patriarch of Jerusalem. But notice this little touch. So on World Children's Day in May, he's going to take 30 Palestinian children and take them to Rome and the world will see this and think how evil Israel is because what she's done to these children. But you can see there's no love lost between the Vatican and Israel. And so we're not surprised that this head of gold is going to be the one power that unites Europe to come against Israel. And it's interesting too, in Europe, two of the most Roman Catholic countries is the Irish Republic uh, and Spain. Um, the first one is uh, the Deputy uh, Prime Minister of the Irish Republic. Well, all the funds are drying up to uh, the United UNRWA we've got to help and we're going to pump money in. In other words, they're siding very heavily uh, with the Palestinian side. And then the next day, uh, the leaders of Spain and the Irish Republic say, well, we've got to look at our relationship with Israel. We've got trade agreements with Israel. If Israel is breaking the law, then we've got to take sanctions against Israel. You can see the hostility building up 
all around the world. But for Israel, she does have friends. And uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 13, which we've already seen a slide of, um, tells us that they're going to be a peoples who at the time when Russia comes down uh, will be on Israel's side and will protest at what is happening. Uh, and what is so interesting is that we can see prophecy coming alive before our eyes. Because Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, all their young lions will say to you, Gog, have you come to take a plunder? Have you gathered your army to take a booty, to gather away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take a great plunder? Now, Sheba and Dedan summarize, really, the Arabian Peninsula, the very place where these Arab nations are wanting to make peace with Israel. And so, isn't it fascinating that two and a half thousand years ago, Ezekiel recorded these words, uh, and we can see them coming to pass before our eyes. Just on last Sunday, uh, Blinken, extraordinary opportunity for Israel to normalize ties with Arab countries. Virtually every Arab country now wants, genuinely, wants to integrate Israel into the region to normalize relations. So, let alone what's been happening in Gaza, the moderate Arab nations are so keen to deal with Israel. I'm just reading the last bit. A recent report indicated that Saudi Arabia will be willing to accept a political commitment from Israel to create a Palestinian state rather than anything more binding in a bid to get a defense pact with Washington approved before the US presidential elections, which of course uh, are at the end of the year. So as far as <coughs> Saudi Arabia is concerned, as long as Israel agrees, yes, we will look at a two-state solution, knowing that it will never work, uh, that's all they need, they're desperate to be able to go to Washington and get Biden to sign uh, a defense pact with them. So the merchants of Tarshish was next in the list. And again, we have seen how Britain, we're not going to look at you know, how we know that the merchants of Tarshish applies to Britain, but it does. Um, within a few, well, less than a week of October the 7th, Britain had put together a package of um, the P-18 aircraft, our surveillance aircraft, uh, and the surveillance assets which Britain has on Cyprus, two ships, um, helicopters and submarines. Um, what Israel has been busy doing is using her listening posts in Cyprus to intercept messages from Hamas and Iran and conveying it to Israel. So, Britain very clearly, right at the beginning, uh, put herself at the disposal of uh, Israel. And then in December, uh, Britain sent aircraft to help hunt for the, terror, uh, for the hostages in the tunnels, presumably using sophisticating radar to try and locate the tunnels. And then just recently, uh, Britain and uh, America and other countries have been attacking the Houthis who again have got to be dealt with because uh, they occupy uh, Sheba uh, and Dedan, the, that area there, and will form part of the kingdom. So that Houthi threat has got to be dealt with so that Yemen can come under Saudi Arabia's uh, control and help and be favorable to Israel. And then finally, all her young lions, and we see the Commonwealth in that. When the Queen died, the Commonwealth didn't die. It's still very active um, and is backing Israel today. And one of the most interesting countries is India. They have got uh, uh, this huge naval operation patrolling Red Sea area and uh, 
further towards India to cut down on piracy. It's their largest deployment in the region. And just again last week, as Biden's support for Israel begins to erode, India set, steps up drone supplies. Now these aren't your cheap and cheerful drones. These are Israeli Heron surveillance drones, which uh, Israel is very dependent upon, which India is licensed to make and use for themselves. Now because of the call-up and all these reservists uh, have had to leave their factories, there's not a lot of manufacturing going on in Israel. So India's stepping up because uh, Israel's lost quite a few of these uh, surveillance drones uh, and is supplying 10 of these very expensive uh, drones. So it's just interesting how step by step the uh, things are, are dropping into place. And so everything we've talked about revolves around the hope of Israel. I do recommend Brother Stephen's book on Elijah, though it's dealing with Elijah. In the background is a lot of information about Israel and what's going on in Israel. And brothers and sisters, how little do we hear in our ecclesias about the hope of Israel and the meaning of it. How often do we remember in our public prayers the stress that God's people are under at the moment? How often do we pray for the peace of Jerusalem? How often do we remember that our Lord and Master was born as King of the Jews? to inherit the throne of Abraham and David, um, to rule as the promised seed from Zion to the ends of the earth. And how often do we remember when we think of the bread and the wine, that this was the risen Lord, who died as King of the Jews, is coming back not only as King of the Jews, but King of the world. So what happened? on October the 7th, has to be a wake-up call to our community to get back to these fundamental things. God's people in God's land are there because God is working with them and he's going to bring them through all these trials and tribulations because it is his plan and purpose. There will be a time of peace. Israel will be trusting in their own might. Just read uh, Isaiah chapter 2. We know those opening verses about the nations coming up, the kingdom age. Uh, like a newspaper headline, that, that's the opening. How is that achieved? Well, the rest of the chapter tells us. And read verses 5 to 8. They're trusting in the things that their hands have made. They're trusting in their own idolatry, the weapons that they have. This is the time of trespass. When that's broken, then they can accept their Messiah. So let's see October the 7th as our wake-up call. So just finally, I just want to put this on. Um, you've probably been wondering what's happened to milestones. Um, my intention was to produce them quarterly uh, and email them out so they're much more up-to-date instead of being a year or year and a half behind that they were up to date. Uh, so I achieved part one and part two. I virtually finished part three when October the 7th happened and I realised, well, this has got to be rewritten. But unfortunately, you know, I have been poorly. And I just haven't had the energy to do it. But what I'm planning to do, God willing now, we've got Prophecy Day nearly over, is to concentrate on doing a combined three and four for publication at the end of March and then hopefully, God willing, we can get on track. So if you don't uh, receive those, they're free, just send an email to me at milestonesuk at gmail.com and I can put you on the list. So no cost at all. So this has been a wonderful session 
concentrating on the most important thing, Israel, God's people, and how they will be saved. Because their salvation is wrapped up in our salvation. Our Lord is coming. And we have to stand before our angels and before the Master. And in the mercy of God, may we be granted an answer of peace that we may go with the Lord Jesus in that mighty work of saving Israel. Thank you.